Hello and welcome to Animal Park. I'm Kate Humble. And I'm Ben Fogel and these are two of Longleat's tapirs. This is Jethro. And Jessie is the mum who's just disappearing off there to see her baby who clearly <laughs> takes after his father. <laughs> no. If you're wondering why they're lying down, it's because they love being tickled behind the ears and I seem to have the touch, Kate. I think that's right. <laughs> well, you, can, you can try tickling mine later. I'm not sure it'll work. But um, we've got lots of stories coming up on today's programme, including... He needs to move 240 deer, but they might make a break for it. If they can push their way underneath it, they will. Once one does it, the rest will follow. The new boy is keen to join the crew, but will he be an able seaman? You've got to understand that apart from all the, the risks of driving a boat, you know, the breaking down, the running the ground, the keeping it in a straight line, yeah. there are animal dangers. And we'll travel back in time to 1966, when the safari park first opened, amidst a public outcry at the idea of 50 African carnivores running around the Wiltshire countryside. But we're going to start down in Pet's Corner. The marmosets are always a popular attraction, particularly when they have a baby. So there was great excitement recently when the keepers realised that Michelle was pregnant again. But now head of section Darren Beasley has called me to say there's some worrying news. Darren, what's going on? Yeah, not good news this morning, Kate, I'm afraid. Um, I come in before everybody else most mornings because we're expecting Michelle, our marmosette, Jeffrey's marmosette, to give birth. I came in this morning uh, uh, unchecked, uh, and she actually had a, a breech birth. She actually had a, a tail coming out of her rear end, and they always, always give birth at night. So the fact that it hadn't passed means it, it was stuck. Um, it's a real worry, you know. It can cause lots and lots of complications. So we called the vet straight away. Um, a vet came out and managed to thankfully remove the breech birth. Yeah. Um, but then was pretty sure there might be something else inside. So the breech birth baby presumably didn't I'm afraid make that, it. that passed away. Right. Um, you know, it, it's really, really sad because Michelle actually has is, is just successfully reared a baby in the, in the last breeding yeah. term. And we thought this time was going to go so swimmingly. And, and um, we've got to look after Michelle's health probably first and foremost. So to remove the breech birth was, was, was a necessity. Um, we'd like her, if there is any more babies, because they always usually give birth to twins or triplets. Right. Um, if there is any more babies, we'd like them to pass them naturally. Yeah. Um, she's had a bit of an injection to try and induce that, because yeah. we think there's another one in there. Um, the fact that it's not happened or still not happened, the vet's taken her off to surgery. Right. Um, and if the worst comes to the worst, they're going to have to perform an emergency caesarean section which, and actually surgically remove the babies that are, or baby that's in there. And did the vet have any idea whether um, that remaining baby is alive or not? I, I think really it's just too, too early to tell. I think um, obviously if it's alive, great, they'll get it out and they'll, we'll either hand rear it or, or give it to mum if she's yeah. well enough. Yeah. Um, but the priority's got to be saving Michelle. It's got to be trying to... to, to stop it getting infected, stop any, any more complications. Yeah. Um, so it is, you know, really worried. It's, it's quite a, a, a sad time, serious time, but vets can do amazing things. Saying so we'll just uh, have to wait and see now. There's no guarantee that Michelle or any babies will survive the operation, but I'll be there to tell you exactly what happens. The fallow and red deer herds have spent the long winter months sheltering in the woods up on Wind Hill. Now the weather's warming up, head of section Tim Yeo wants to bring more than 240 animals down to their summer pasture, where the public can see them. But he has one or two jobs to do first. There's quite a bit of debris around here. Just picked some, uh, some plasticky litter up here and this wire here. Now, um, what, what I'm doing is we've just recently had uh, all the fence redone, as you can see along the side here, all new wire. But uh, there are bits of offcuts here um, that, are, that are left here. Now, they all need picking up because we're about to bring the fallow deer back into this section and bits of wire like this, they will find uh, the bucks particularly are still in hard antler and they will 
play about with these with their antlers and invariably the, the wire gets caught on the antlers. Well, obviously, I mean, the, the, these are all hazards. They really are. I mean, they, they, they've got to be, these have all got to be cut off uh, much closer right back here. It's literally a case of going around everything and making sure that you, you know, you really don't think that an animal can hurt itself in any way on it. And uh, there's quite a bit of work to be done here. I've only looked at a, a small bit of this fencing and uh, there's a lot more to check out. Uh, so uh, I sincerely hope it's not all going to be like this. Deer are naturally inquisitive. And if Tim has left any holes, they're sure to find them. When they arrive in, in this section, you can bet your bottom dollar that they'll walk all of this. And if there's a place to get through, um, if they can get their head and neck there, they'll push through and they're gone. This gap between ground and, uh, and bottom of fence, and there's a bit of a hole here, maybe a rabbit's pulled out, that, that's got to be closed down. If they can push their way underneath it, um, they will. Once one does it, the rest will follow. To move so many animals at once, Tim needs to get the herds used to following him down to the enclosure. For the last few, few days, uh, feed time, I've been running them up there with the, the, the bike, you know, just driving over there and feeding right out to, up to the, the gate and just inside the, the raceway. Uh, so it's getting them used to going right up and being fed in that area. And so when, when we're ready to move, uh, the gates will be opened and they'll follow me. A lot of them will follow down, we hope. Tim's planned the move as best he can and knows that now is the time to get on with it. It's drawn to the, the end of the winter now and they need to come off this, this pasture here and we need to rest this in preparation for, for, for later in the, in the year. And, uh, and also, of course, you know, we need to get them through. The, the public are waiting to, to interact and feed them. We'll come back when Tim's ready to roll. But will the big move go like a dream or turn into a nightmare? Earlier on, we heard that Michel the Marmoset has had a stillbirth and now needs a caesarean section to save both herself and any remaining babies. I've come to the surgery in Froome, where vet John Gould and his team will be performing the operation. Okay. So that's a clever device, yeah. so you put the, yeah. the anaesthetic sort of gases that's it. through, yeah. do you? They're using an anaesthetic gas to sedate Michelle because it's less stressful than injecting such a small creature. Even pregnant, she only weighs about seven pounds. It's not the same as if you're injecting a dose, right. you're giving her seven percent, so. Seven, uh, mostly oxygen and 7% of anaesthetic agent. Right. And that's to anaesthetise to start with. And this is something called seafluorine, which is, which is dead safe. Right. And it's something that um, they use on children in hospitals. So oh, okay. I think that's one of the safest. The vet's top priority is to save Michelle. If he can also save any babies inside her, everyone will be delighted. So feeling her, yeah. do you have any idea how many she might have no. in there? No. I'm really feeling to see how far down the pelvic canal it is. Right. I think it's the hair just there, but I don't know how many there are. I guess only one probably. But I'll to see. Right, I've got to go and scrub myself up. <laughs> John has never conducted a caesarean on a marmoset before. The only encouragement that I can give the team is that at least this isn't Michelle's first pregnancy. She had one the first time she didn't do very well. And then the last time, I mean, she's got a thriving is four or five one? months old yeah. one. Do they have to hand rear one? They had in one. the office. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we kept the the second one, Mandu, that she's got at the moment, yeah, absolutely right. fine, no problem. There might be a faint 
Ready? Yeah. Let me just test how it looks. So what do you do now? Have you just stimulate really? Right. Um, clear any airways mm -hmm. so they can start to breathe. So we've separated it from its mother now. So it needs to breathe on its own. So it's just to see some kind of life there. Something is there. If this had been a natural delivery, the baby would have been born some hours ago. Now its life is hanging by a very slender thread. Some bubbles coming from the nose. Nostrils here. It's mm -hmm. nice. The candle of hope flickered for a few minutes more, but the baby was just too weak to survive. The baby's death was a tragedy, but John is confident that Michelle will make it. I mean, she'll come around for anaesthetic within minutes because this souffle that we use is very short acting. Right. Which is something we want, you know, you want to, as soon as you finish stitching them up, as quickly as possible to get them back on their feet, whatever species they are, I think. Yeah. Let's put some glue on it as well. There's always a danger of respiratory difficulties while animals are under general anaesthetic, so John revives Michelle as soon as he can. She's beginning to come along, John. You expect her to recover fully? Yeah, she should, she should be fine, I would say, within a couple of days. OK, good. Yeah. Well, John, thank you very much. OK, no problem. To be here and we'll keep our fingers crossed for Michelle and, of course, bring you any news when we get it. They're hoping for some babies any day now in Wolfwood too. But the keepers have learned from experience that the pack becomes particularly dangerous when there are cubs around. For the next few months, it will be hard to get a close look at the wolves to spot any illnesses or injuries. So Bob Trollop and Brian Kent have decided to hand feed them for a change. Bob, what's the plan now? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to grab small handfuls and just chuck it out. And it's basically a forage feed. Okay, because usually you would put a whole carcass down, wouldn't we you? We would put a whole carcass down um, so that the, the pack structure would work. And um, this way, it simulates in the wild. They wouldn't hunt every day. Mm -hmm. um, and they wouldn't always have prey on hand. So all they do is they, they will forage for food. And what we'll do is we just chuck them. And I have to out. ask before we feed them while we're out here, I know we've got um, Brian Kent over there keeping, yeah. a, keeping a beady eye on things, but we're, we're safe with raw food in our hands, are we? Oh, to a certain extent, yeah. You know, there's safety in numbers, obviously. Okay. Um, but if we just chuck pieces out, yeah. just so that it, they have to look for it. OK. And it's just a, it's a sort of enrichment, is it, for the, for the wolves to encourage them to, to forage a little more? Yeah, and to use all their senses. Obviously, this is a small chunk of meat that we're chucking out, and they've actually got to find it. Right. And in this long grass, you know, they've got to use their senses to, to hone in on these small pieces. So how often would you do something like this? Uh, we don't do it all the time. We do it maybe once, twice a week. Right. And it's, it's uh, to enrich them. In the wild, they would forage for small mammals, you mm -hmm. know, voles, mm -hmm. mice, um, berries, anything like that, right. when they couldn't get a bison or an elk. So it's... Uh, I'm amazed how close they're actually willing to come to oh, us. Yeah, they're they, not too yeah, they, timid, are they? They're used to it now. Right. But is this, is this just, you've done, it, you've done this so often now that they're, they're not too scared about us? Their concern is to try and find the pieces before any of the other pack members do. Right. So, you know, and there doesn't seem to be too much sort of fighting for the pieces or anything? No, no, they're pretty good at it, I must admit. You know, if you feed a whole carcass, then there would be bickering. Mm -hmm. And that's mainly to get into the, the best position, just right. into the best position. But because there's loads of pieces going out, there's not one piece for them to sort of hone in for so they will just search about for it. And Bob, how likely um, are they to actually have pups this season? Um, pretty likely we, we're pretty sure that the, the deed has been done okay. and uh, we're looking forward to some pups this year. 
Excellent. Well, Bob, thank you very much for um, letting us come out and help with this most unusual of feeds. Quite amazing. Here you go, wolves. As well as running Pets Corner, Darren Beasley is also in charge of the safari boats on Half Mile Lake. And today there's a new recruit who wants to join the crew. But 22-year-old Dominic Shepherd has never driven a boat or addressed the public before. And he has just two weeks to learn the ropes before Darren needs him out on the water. Not really nervous. I've got enough confidence to do it. It's just learning all the uh, basics which I need to know to do it and then hopefully I'll be fine when I get on there and do it. It's not just driving a boat and looking after the visitors, it's delivering our commentary and the commentary has to be clear and understanding and has to be full of facts and has to be entertaining and of course on top of that poor guy's an animal keeper, he has to learn all about the sea lions, about the hippos, the gorillas, all the wildlife down here. Uh, he's got to learn about meerkats and pigs I don't know, I think if we tell him, he's probably going to throw himself in the lake, I think, in horror. Rather meanly, I've got to give him a deadline, because, you know, Easter's approaching us fast, we've got to get his licence, we've got to get him up and running, so we're up against it. Dom was a stable lad before coming here. He spent the last fortnight finding his feet in Pet's Corner, which is also part of the job, but now he'll need to find his sea legs. Before I come here, I didn't really know anything um, about the animals which I'm working with now, but uh, I've learned a hell of a lot in the last few weeks since working here, so I'm confident enough that I'm going to learn enough to do the commentary. It's a big ask of anybody. The, the, the boats is a very difficult job. It's, you know, in the summer, these guys will be doing 30 trips a day. <laughs> There's no substitute for the real thing, so Darren takes Dom out to get a feel for the boat and the scale of the task ahead of him. You've got to understand that apart from all the, the risks of driving a boat, you know, the breaking down, the running aground, the keeping it in a straight line, yeah. there are animal dangers, yeah? Yeah, yeah? You have to be in control of all these visitors. Everybody's thrown fish in now, left, right and centre. Yeah. You've got to check that nobody's dangling their hand over. It's too dangerous. <laughs> You've got to check that all the sea lions are getting the right amount of fish. That's really difficult. As I said, I will give you a deadline. Learn your safety, learn your paperwork, learn your facts, handle the boat, all right? Keep smiling, as I say, recognise all the sea lions. You've got to have fun. If you're having fun, the visitors will have fun as well. All right? OK. You up for it, then? You'll do I'm it. Gonna, I'm going to do it. You'll do it. <laughs> this is a bit full on, but I want to be able to do it and challenge it and do it, definitely, yeah. With the introduction out of the way, it's time for Dom to master the ship's paperwork. Right. Yes. Taking the ropes off in the correct order. There's lesson one. Well done, you've passed. <laughs> Only 964 lessons to go. What I'm going to want you to do now is take your homework, OK, your coffee break work, your go-to-bed work. Yeah. You've got your, your, your crew, crew training portfolio. So in there is your man... Or everything. Everything you need to know. That's your boat operational manual in there. Um, so you need to take that. Read it, learn it. I'll then come back and talk you, talk you through it, and then you'll sign it and give it back to me. Okay. In here, we've got the gorilla facts, sea lion facts, but yeah. we really need you up and running on all the boat safety, yeah. driving a boat, and of course, recognizing and understanding these animals. Cool, yep. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Dom has just two weeks to become a keeper, a speaker, and a skipper. We'll come back to see if he can do it. Up on Wind Hill, it's time for the herds of red and fallow deer to move down to their summer pasture. Head of section Tim Yeo is ready to lead them, but are they ready to follow? Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully what will happen now is uh, when I go down to the deer and, and work my way up to the, the corridor where we let the deer through into the, into the, the, the reserve, um, hopefully they'll follow me up and... Uh, follow me down the raceway. I think probably it's, um, there's a good chance it'll, it'll work pretty well because they're, they're ready to move now. They've been in here a, a good while, as I say, and uh, I think really they can probably smell the new grass in the other section that's been left, uh, left alone over the, 
the winter, so uh, I, I suspect it won't be too bad. Tim must lead the herd across wide parkland and then into a narrow fenced corridor leading to a gate or raceway. This is the tricky bit. A cornered red deer can jump a barrier more than two metres high. The fence here is not tall enough to stop them and if some escape, others will certainly follow. But it all goes well, and when the last few stragglers have reached the pasture and settled down to graze with the rest of the herd, Tim can look back on a day's work well done. Very happy, very happy. That, that, was, that was excellent. I mean, the majority of the, of the fallow are in here, I think, really. I mean, it's, uh, I'll have to have a look uh, back in the park where we've just bought them, but uh, I think a good few are here, and that went very, very well. A nice, smooth operation, you know, they came through well. They certainly will be happier, I think, from a deer's point of view. There's nothing like the, the grass that they, that they get once the grass starts growing. It's growing in here. This has been rested, this pasture. And uh, for them to come onto this, it's like uh, a kid in a candy store. You know, it really is good. The deer have been grazing in the park here since Longleat House was built nearly 450 years ago. But by the 1940s, Longleat was facing a crisis. Running costs of half a million pounds a year and a death duty bill of over 18 million meant that the sixth Marquis was faced with the danger of losing his ancestral home. The Marquis, who was the current Lord Bath's father, made the momentous decision to become the first owner of a stately home to admit the public and charge them admission fees. As the head guide, Claire Mound, recounts, it did not go down well with his peers. Certainly the sixth Marquis was considered to have let the side down by opening his house to the public. People paid, went into business. It really was not, not considered a good thing at all. He took a great risk uh, in uh, really opening Longleat in the first place. Uh, I think it was against the sort of family interests, against everything he'd done before. Uh, but what he realised was if he didn't do something like that, how on earth could he keep the house and the estate going? The gamble paid off, and over 130,000 visitors a year helped to pay the bills. But by the mid-60s, other stately homes had opened in competition and the numbers were falling. The Marquis needed a new idea to bring the crowds back in, and, as he recalled in an interview shot in 1976, it came to him when he met a friend from an old circus family. Why did you do it in the first place? Well, I was approached by um, Jimmy Chipperfield, my partner, in 1964, who said he wanted to see me about having a, some, keeping some animals here, and I thought he meant a zoo. But, of course, what he said, oh, I don't want a zoo like everybody else has got. I want to have a, a park where the animals can roam free and the people be in cages. Well, actually, that took me back. And I said, you must give me a fortnight to think about it. And during that fortnight, I talked to a lot of people. And they said, I wouldn't touch it at the end of a barge pole. You only have 500 cars around. You know, when they begin to say, it makes you think. But then I thought hard. And I thought, Jimmy's right. We'll get many more people around this house. And that's the whole object of the exercise, from my point of view, is to get more people around the house so that I can keep it in the family as long as one can. I agreed. The Safari Park opened in 1966, with 50 lions brought in from zoos in Europe and big game dealers in Ethiopia. But letting these wild beasts loose on an English estate caused a national uproar. When he opened the Safari Park, it was considered outrageous. Um, I mean, the, the idea in the mid-60s of having uh, lions running around in Wiltshire uh, took a lot of understanding. 
um, and indeed it would anywhere if you were in introducing, uh, you know, large African carnivores uh, to pastoral England. And so it certainly caused a major stir. Questions were even asked in Parliament, and the press labelled Lord Bath as the Mad Marquis. But as today's head warden Keith Harris remembers, it was the neighbours who put up the fiercest opposition. The local villages and towns were frightened to death that um, they'd have lions roaming everywhere because of the, the fencing wouldn't keep them in. And uh, there was a lot of lion experts that said, oh, well, you know, chain link fences would... Um, the lions would walk through them and they'd be out. The job of making sure that the lions didn't get out fell to the safari park's first head warden, Mike Lockyer. He was an ex-army mine clearance officer who had experience of working with wild animals in Africa. We had some uh, basic knowledge of what animals would do, but because nothing quite like it had been done, we didn't know exactly what would happen. It was the unknown that was the, the sort of thrilling bit. And I was terribly excited. I mean, it was a thing that I, I felt I wanted to do. I knew it was pioneering, it was experimental, and it was going to be a lot of fun, a lot of interest. The 100-acre lion enclosure was surrounded by heavy-duty chain-link fence, army surplus from prisoner of war camps in Korea, but they weren't leaving anything to chance. It was decided that we should, we should do a night watch, and uh, so there were about uh, 10 to 12 hours overnight period where we uh, would patrol around the, f the outside of the fence with big torches and guns and things. And at that stage, there was a big double bed in the pheasantry, and four of us fellows had to um, share that. It would take three if you sort of lie to attention. So you'd go out, do your two or three hours around the park, uh, come back, get in the right-hand side of the bed, everybody moved over, and the one who fell out on the left-hand side of the bed was his turn to go on duty until he came back. As it turned out, it was a good thing that the fence was patrolled. This fence is higher than the first ones we, we put up. We, we had fences that were about two metres, and honestly, it wasn't enough, and they did occasionally go over. We weren't that worried because they were still within the main reserve. But um, as you can see, they, they do get interested if you turn your back to them. The lions here today are divided into three quite separate prides. Each of those prides has a dominant male and a hierarchy of females and youngsters, mirroring what would happen in the wild. But when the lions first came here, nearly all of them were adult males. In the early days, you took what you could get. To start with, they worked out their own structure because it was all one big lion reserve, no, no divided sections. And they were just let out and to see how they got on. And there was quite a bit of fighting to start with, a little sort of hierarchy uh, business going on. Lion fighting is very often uh, fur flying and looking terrible, and then you see them get up and walk away. I mean, they don't always end up in serious injuries or fatalities because they're, they're just pretty tough animals. In those days, animal management was rather more haphazard than it is now. It was exciting, and, and health and safety issues weren't really very important in those days. People did all sorts of things uh, which nowadays would not be allowed. Never having seen lions outside a zoo before, the public took a lot of risks too, and we'll bring you more of that later. But building on the success of the lions of Longleat, the safari park introduced other animals as well, and there are now over 40 species romping around here. The park plays an important role in several international breeding programs, not least with the herd of Rothschild giraffe, who've produced three calves this season already. Rothschilds are seriously endangered in the wild, but they've been so successful here in the safety of the East African enclosure that head of section Andy Hayton's come up with a novel way to keep track of them all. Now, I know that these are your new boards of the family trees of various yeah. animals here, and we've got the giraffes here. Well, specifically, Jolly the giraffe. Yeah, this is specifically Jolly's family. You can see all her uh, immediate relations on there. Just amazing how many calves she had. She's a really, really good 
prolific and, and a, breeder. And she's still around, of course. She's still here, yeah, and hopefully we'll have more to come from her. With, um, with one granddaughter, Ella. One granddaughter last year, yeah. Now, I have to ask, how, how do you decide the names of, of the various giraffes here? We're actually doing it now. It started back in 2000. They, they did it years and years ago. They, they gave a, a letter to a year. OK. So it's easier to look back through the records, you can tell. So like, like they year. did with hurricanes, I think, <laughs> yeah, out in yeah, the Caribbean. Yeah, absolutely. So Amber was in 2000, and then you've got on... Uh, this is on, another family tree that's over, another family. That's over Charlotte's there. family. Yep. Becky and Imogen are actually sisters who are here. OK. You can see Bertram was 2001. Right. And then back to Chikula, yep. Deanne, and Eliza and Ella last year. Yeah. This year's F. F. With Flynn, the little Z. Um, I was going to so, suggest Fogel. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, yeah, we didn't think that. we got a couple due, actually, but it might be a bull giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, OK. So, and speaking of the bulls, um, obviously a lot of these are, are females. Where, where do the males fit in here? What we try to do is any males we have born here, we'll move on to another collection. We'll mm -hmm. keep all the females here and we'll bring a non-related male in so there's no inbreeding and you get a good, strong bloodline. Excellent. Well, Andy, thank you very much. Okay. We have plenty more fascinating facts coming up on today's programme, including... We'll go back in time again to see an experiment about the danger of leaving your car. It did rather show people what could possibly happen and then would make them think twice how and why you should set about spring cleaning your tortoise and impress your friends with the top tips we'll be giving you on how to tell a fallow deer from a red. But first, down at Half Mile Lake, new boy Dom Shepherd has a week to go before his test for the combined job of boat driver and pet's corner guide. By then, he needs to know all about the animals as well as becoming a certified boat handler and an accomplished public speaker. Learning the commentary has been a bit of a challenge. It's been fun, though, been just knowing the knowledge, really, and trying to spit it out and getting everything run smoothly. <laughs> With ten years' experience on the boats, Bill Lord is the resident ancient mariner in charge of showing Don the ropes. We're going to teach him to drive straight, take it to a designated point, like we're going to take him over to the hippos now, and ask him to hold the boat parallel to the bank, but not too close in, so we can then commentate to the public what they're going to see. Come on, Dom. I think you're up for this. OK. Well... I want you to describe what they're seeing. I'll take the handle. Well, you, take, you do the commentary. OK. Well, we have two Ugandan hippos, uh, Sonia and Spot. On land, hippos can run at about 30 miles an hour, so uh, there's no way of really outrunning an angry hippo. <laughs> and what do you tell them after they've chewed you up? OK, yeah. Um, hippos are herbivores, so it's quite lucky that uh, they won't really eat us, but the only thing that they chew us up, bite our arms off, and then chuck us back out again, so... It's uh, not very nice, really, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, another loop. Dom's struggling already, but by the time they reach Gorilla Island, he's completely lost the plot. OK, we have two uh, hippo... I'll take the boat then. Yeah. Okay. OK, we have two uh, gorillas, Samba and Nico. Uh, we have one uh, silverback, which is Nico. Um, well, gorillas. Gorillas really only like a certain amount of area when they are uh, in a particular territory, so they only surround a certain uh, amount of area. Um, I'm sure Bill will, under will tell you a little bit more about it, really. No, you're doing the commentary, not me. <laughs> Well, Dom's trying to do the commentary, but now he has another job to do as well, and it's getting very noisy. OK, hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Um, we are at the feeding end of the lake. Um, we feed at this end of the lake just so that sea lions know they're getting fed this side and not down by the dock area. OK, we feed our fish 65 pounds of fish every single day. We like to feed them oily fish. This just helps the condition. Um, so if anyone would like to feed the sea lions, you can. They're pots on sale for 50p a pot or two for a pound. So Dom's mastered the money, but when it comes to identifying the sea lions, he's completely out of his depth. 
Fortunately, he has an experienced shipmate, Stuart Cluley, to help him out. You've got to try and learn which one's great and everything else. Um, Buster's male, obvious, big dark sea lion. You've got Marcy at the back there. He's our younger male now, he's only two years old. They're quite easy to tell apart at the moment just because of the size difference. Then you've got the four girls. Uh, to begin with, it's daunting. You first got the boat and think, oh, God, I'm never going to be able to tell these apart. But then after it soon picks up, and all of a sudden one day it's like, that's Aussie, that's Nancy. You just get it really quickly and then you know. Dom may be drowning in information already, but Bill still wants to teach him one more thing. You know the controls here? Your gear lever for forward, stern, throttle, wheel, yep. you're in charge. OK? The Lady Bee weighs six tonnes, but she rises 15 feet out of the water and can be hard to control, even in light breezes. Now, the wind's actually favourable today. It's slightly in our face, which means you can go in reasonably firm and it won't blow the tail out, OK? Into reverse now. A few revs. We'll pull it up. It'll pull the bow out, take the stern in. Just bring the bow in a bit. Into reverse and, and some revs just to stop it. There you go. OK, now a stern. A few revs. That was the bang that we didn't want. Okay. The loop nearly went for a bar. OK, take it out again. You're done. Dom only struck the jetty a glancing blow, and the consequences were hardly titanic, so Bill thinks it's worth persisting with the lad. I think he's uh, going to make a good boatman, yeah. He seems got the feel of the boat. That's the answer. You've got to get the feel of that boat. Don't let the boat run you, you run the boat. And I think he understands that, and he's doing it quite well. But I think he's getting there. The docking, that was spot-on docking there, so Bill's training's obviously paid off. Just need to get me uh, commentary a bit more running smoothly and knowing a little bit more knowledge and hopefully it's going to get there doing, doing some more practice ones and just doing as many as I can really with the public on board. It's just a dream at the moment. Still on like the honeymoon bit where I'm just loving everything that I'm doing. So yes, yeah, amazing. Dom had a fair win today, but his test next week will be a much sterner passage. We'll be there to see whether he sinks or swims. Well, no prizes for guessing that I am in the deer park with Tim Yeo. And Tim, they look like they've settled down really well after their move. Kate, they have, they have settled down incredibly well. I mean, they're really very happy in here now. Why do you have to move them from one part of the estate to the other? Well, the, the, uh, the main reason that we do it for is, uh, is we're, we're bringing them back in so that the public can meet them. Yeah. That's the, that's the main reason. Um, I mean, there are a couple of other reasons. Uh, one is that uh, the, the, their winter area that we call Wind Hill, the hill that we're looking at there, right. That, that area is, is very sheltered. There are a lot of uh, old, old fallen trees and, and branches, and um, it's a wonderful place for them to, to spend the winter. They get a lot of... A uh, bit more protection and stuff. Yes, certainly from the elements there. Yeah. And, and another very important reason is it, we're, we're resting the pastures. We've got these two pastures we can alternate, yeah. and uh, we can also try and control the sort of parasite burden uh, a bit, um, in the sense that the, the deer do ingest internal parasites that, yeah. that can damage them internally and so by taking them off the ground um, those parasites can't they can die out uh, die out exactly they can't and the grass them. can can regenerate exactly so they can come back and gorge themselves on the spring grass although this That's one seems right. very happy with pony nuts now you've got so many deer here and um, there are obvious differences but what what would be your guide to deer spotting Tim what I mean these deer here that we're looking at what are these well these Kate are, are red deer right red deer hinds the females the females okay that's right who are very friendly with the <laughs> camera there the fallow deer are smaller than the red deer yeah they're, they're usually spotted and also the bucks have palmated antlers right. means it's it's like a like, it like the palm like of a, your hand it looks like the palm Whereas, of a hand like that exactly right. whereas the red deer the red deer don't they have just tines growing 
um, branched out tines. Looks a bit like an oak tree sometimes on, on somebody's head. Tim, thank you very much indeed. Are you after more food by any chance? Back in 1966, the first head warden, Mike Lockyer, was entering unknown territory. No one could give him any advice on how to manage 50 lions in the grounds of an English country house, because nobody had ever done it before. We knew the risks. Uh, just, just as a racing driver knows that he could get, he could crash. Um, fishermen go to sea; they, they know the risks. Um, I, I think it's a shame that we've we've lost a lot of that sort of personal um, contact with the animals. Amazingly, the keepers would often get out of their vehicles. Many of the lions were from zoos or hand-reared, but that didn't mean they were safe. There were once, once or twice when uh, I was a bit worried about the distance and I had to say, right, that, that lion is actually stalking me. Have I got time to get back to the vehicle or have I got to stand here and bluff it out? And, um, of course, if you've got a gun, you, 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 don't, you don't mind bluffing out. If you haven't, you have to think, this is the sort of moment of truth. <laughs> do you stare them down or do you get back? But I've been lucky. I mean, I've just had a lucky life. I've had a few injuries, but nothing, uh, nothing too bad. But it wasn't just the keepers who were at risk. Back in the 60s, the public had never experienced anything like this before, and they had to be taught the dangers. People did very odd things. They, they'd, uh, you know, open the doors, put, uh, go around to get the thermos flask out of the boot and even check their oil. I mean, they, if they didn't actually see a lion, and lions are quite good at hiding, if they didn't actually see a lion, they thought, well, they're none for miles around, so they would quite um, happily get out, not realising that maybe, you know, ten yards away in a, in a hollow, there, was, there would be a lion sitting there. Mike decided that it was time the public saw what could happen if they strayed from their cars. We did several things. We, we, we put luggage on cars because lots of cars used to come through with luggage on the luggage racks, which was a bit vulnerable. And then we, we set up uh, a stunt with, with a dummy, quite realistic looking, a fully dressed cook and everything, you know, um, leaning over his car and then just let the lions find it and to see what they do. And, of course, they grabbed the dummy and ran off with it, and it was really quite dramatic to watch. It was a good publicity stunt, of course, uh, but it also did um, rather show people what, what could possibly happen and then would make them think twice. Earlier on, we saw Michelle the Marmoset having a caesarean section. She's been recuperating for four days now, so I've come down to Pet's Corner to ask Head of Section Darren Beasley how she's getting on. She is, honestly, she's fantastic. Um, I'm always saying to people, this animal business is, it's like an emotional roller coaster because, you know, we were so excited because she was going to have babies yeah. and then look what happened. You know, you, you're so worried you're going to lose her. <laughs> no. Look at her, look at her, she's <laughs> like, give me that food, quick. So I do that. If she had a can opener, she would have opened that glass there, I think. <laughs> oh, I've, told, I've also got in here. Can you hold that just I've a minute? I've got yeah. that, yeah. I have one of her all-time favourites. A niggly wiggly. I have a locust. Oh, fantastic. So should we just see if she'll... When I saw her at the vets, just beginning to come round, but still quite groggy, she take it from your yeah, hand? Oh, good. wow, look at that. Um, you're obviously worried that they're not going to come yeah. round well or it's going to take a bit of time, but, I mean, looking at her now, she looks like it was a pretty quick recovery. Amazing. I mean, these animals are, are true survivors. I mean, that's major surgery. I mean, that, yes. that's, a, that's rehabilitation should take, you know, two, three weeks. And I'm sure, you know, she's still very early days. Yeah. But she's running around, she's active. You know, she is, she's a survivor. I mean, she's just been through major surgery and now you wouldn't know, you know. And, I mean, I'm very tempted. We've got the vet coming in um, to have a look at her. And yeah. I'm actually very tempted to say, can we put her back into her natural exhibit environment, you yeah. know, where she feels at home. Because, in fact, looking at her, looking at her appetite, she's polishing off, food, or polishing off the food, she's yeah. very, very active. Yeah, I mean, she's I've, finished off that locust in I've, seconds, hasn't uh, she? I've got absolutely no problems with her, no problems. She's, I mean, I think 
the, the, the problem is with having stitches, yeah. we've got to monitor it very close, closely because she can damage herself. Yeah, yeah. But so, so basically, she's in here for the moment purely so that the others can't get at the stitches. Is yeah. that is that the general uh, thought? Uh, and also, when any animal's been sedated or been stitched or had had major surgery, you've got to watch the first forty-eight hours, the first year, because there are things can react. You know, right. things you think you're home and dry, and then again, as I say, this roller coaster, things can go dreadfully wrong. But looking at her now, she's nice and warm. She's got a lovely appetite. She's very active. Um, I'm sure she must be a bit sore, but she's not she's showing, not showing it. any no, signs of it at all, <laughs> is she? And will there be any problem? I, I, I know this is talked about with, with other animals that have been taken out of a group situation or a herd situation that they sort of lose their place. I, I honestly think they've got a, such a strong social bond that, that the group... She should be accepted straight back. I think my concern would be is if it got worse, if we had uh, complications now and we couldn't put her back in, we'd have to then remove her daughter because what will ha happen is Dad would then... She produces... Mum here produces chemicals which stops any other females or males in the group breeding. Right. Well, of course, what we'd have to do is make sure that if she's not producing those chemicals, Dad doesn't suddenly get amorous and, and so on. So I think we've got to put her in as soon as we can and there right. should be no problem at all. Well, it's really, really good to see her. Lovely, I mean, <laughs> basically, just looking back on form, munching banana, and very, very happy indeed. Darren, I'm, I'm sad that the outcome wasn't better, but it's just great news that she's, she's well and happy. Thank you very much. Brilliant. The tortoises are amongst my favourite creatures in Pets Corner, so I've come to help keeper Bev Allen with some spring cleaning. Hi Bev, I'm going to step very carefully over here. So um, what does a spring clean involve? Um, basically what we do is we clean their shells. OK. Um, the reason we do that is because the shells got little pores in them right. on top and they're like solar-powered creatures. They need the sun to make them active, to make them eat the food properly. The hotter it is, the more food they are eating. OK. Um, so, so who should we...? Um, we'll do this one here. OK. Um, this is um, one of the ones that we bred here, um, which is about seven years old now, so he's really? doing well, yeah. Excellent. Um, so all we want to do yep. is use warm water Okay. and you just get the brush down yep. and you just want to gently sort of scrub the top of the shell just sort of like that yeah that's can they, fine can they can they feel that can you can you rub too hard or anything uh, yeah that shell is like a finger now they can feel oh, you sort of, um, sort of brushing it yeah and is each is each shell totally unique to each individual tortoise it is you never find um two tortoise shells that are exactly the same it's like a, our fingerprints are totally right. different so it's now, quite I have to speaking of it just down here it looks like this one's got a plaster on it it has. That's Egon. Um, the top of his shell is actually rubbing on the back of his neck. And the skin's there's quite delicate, so we put the plaster, See, on, the plaster on. And it's done the job. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Ingenious. Yeah. OK, how are we done on the, right. the top shell there? Yeah, that's lovely. Um, okay. If you do the end of the shell as well. OK, and it, so you turn it over? That's yeah, not, it's, it's, it's OK over. for the tortoise, is it? Yeah, as long as you don't leave him upside down for too long, okay. it's fine. That's is he OK? It. Is yeah, he OK? It's okay. We'll sort of hold him like that. OK. Give and just, just do a little bit of a. Yeah. There we go. And then what we will do is yep. use this cloth here and just wipe over as well. OK, just to wipe off yeah. any kind of residue. Presumably in the wild, um, rain and ponds and general water would yeah, keep it clean. Yeah, rain will sort of help to keep it clean. I mean, the rain here would as well, but we just do it just, yep. you know, to help them along. And on the other side it, as well? On the other side. OK. And that's it. And then you've got to sort of dry them off as well. <laughs> OK. <laughs> And if someone has a pet tortoise at home, would, would you recommend that they do this? Um, I would, yes. It's, it's just a nice way to keep the shell in good condition, really. Mm -hmm. um, and also you can give them a health check, make sure their claws are not too long. Right. Um, also, their, their mouth, the beaks, we call beaks? it. Yeah, like a parrot a, beak? Yeah, it's, it's similar. Um, and basically, it will grow. Um, so you need to give them, um, like, big... Um, dandelions to nibble on as such. OK, and, and I was going to say, grind there's, it down. there's, there's um, a whole big pile of dandelions over there and one lone tortoise <laughs> who seems to have gorged himself already. I think yeah. he's, he's practically falling asleep over <laughs> he's there. He's had enough. But, I mean, dandelions are the best diet because it's a high-calcium, low-protein diet right. which you want to achieve. Um, and if their the beaks are too long, we've um, got the vet that comes in and we right. trim him down for us. Excellent. How do we think um, we've done on that cleaning? Yeah, that's... Nice and dry? That's fine, you can go down. Are we down. happy to put him back yeah. down? Well, there we have one very clean tortoise ready to go and gorge himself on the dandelions. I think I'll put you down over there. Enjoy.
Down at Half Mile Lake, it's time for aspiring keeper Dom Shepherd to take the plunge. His animal knowledge is good, but Pets Corner also run the safari boats, and today Dom has to convince head of section Darren Beasley that he deserves the job. We have the daily checks, we have the weekly checks, we have engineers checks, um, we have the animal checks, you know, he's got to make sure the animals are all healthy, he's got to do the fish prep, he's got to make sure the stuff's ordered for the next day. It's a lot to work whiz around in, in, in your mind. So far, so good, but now Dom has to face a boatload of the paying public. The commentary is very difficult to get over clearly and accurately, as well as trying to remember about the safety. So we've got a few passengers on board, so I think we're going to get on and throw him in at the deep end, as you like to say, down the boat. So, see how he goes. Nervous. Very nervous. A lot more nervous than it is normally, but hopefully I'll show him that I can do it and do the best, really, that I can do, so, yeah. Seizing the moment and the microphone, Dom launches into his routine. OK, well, welcome aboard the Lady B. Welcome to Longleat. If I were to ask you to take a seat until the vessel has turned around, then you can stand for the rest of the journey. In our lake, we have six Californian sea lions. Our oldest sea lion is Ozzy. She's 26 years old. She was born and bred at Longleat, and she's had eight pups. Our largest sea lion is Buster. He's 10 years old, and he's a massive 30 stone. OK, if you have a look on the right side of the vessel, behind the bramble bush, we have two Ugandan hippopotamuses, Sonia and Spot. They're both two tons in weight. They're 13 feet long. They can open their mouth up to 150 degrees. The wind's getting up on the lake, but Dom has weathered his storm. Well done, Dom. Good night, mate. Dom looks like he's sailing through his test, but what do the passengers think? Very well explanatory, yeah, and it's do with talk about, yeah, perfect. Very informative, yes. Yeah, we learned all we need to know about the sea lions and the hippos. Quite dangerous, I understand. I thought he was very informative, very, very clearly spoken, yes. I thought, I thought he took it off very well. Uh, no hesitation, uh, extremely lucid, very good. Four marks, hard employment. Autograph a second for the lady. So the jury's impressed, but ultimately Darren Beasley is the judge of who joins his team. Well done. That was really good. Thank you. How did you feel doing it? A lot more confident than I thought, actually. Yeah, yeah it was I think I got quite a bit of information out. So well I enjoyed that, yeah. Well it, it's it's really important. When I listen to someone's first commentary like yourself, I understand you're nervous. Um, but it is important that your facts are accurate. I honestly think for the first time. That was really, really good, so thank you very much. Cool, thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you, that's good, yeah, thank you. It's been a tough two weeks, but Dom has passed with flying colours. He has a new job, and Darren has a new boatman. I'm chuffed. When we get a new crew member in the team, it's a nice feeling, um, but really, they've got to take the credit, because they've worked hard, Dom's put the hours in, he's, he's learnt his facts, he's practised his driving, um, he's going to do it in a couple of stormy days now, and, and I say... Here we go. Nothing quite like messing about on the river. <laughs> there was a massive achievement doing that, signing all that. When I first started, I thought, oh, my God, how am I going to get all that signed? But now I feel happy I've done it all and I think I'll be, I'll be just as good as the others one day soon. So, yeah, can't wait. Kate and I are up in the giraffery with head of section Andy Hayton, and we have a most unusual task. Oh, Andy. quite a painful one, <laughs> even with gloves on. You didn't gloves, tell me yeah. this. <laughs> what on earth are we stuffing nettles in a cage for? This is environment enrichment for the giraffes. I mean, not only are nettles actually good green food and full of iron, yeah. but it's really good enrichment for the giraffes. I mean, we put the main bulk of their feed in the troughs and the hay racks. Right. Um, but this is giraffe TV. They can sit here <laughs> all night picking really? away at this. <laughs> oh, <I'm right> <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll pick away at this 
throughout the night, so we make this really, really difficult for them to get out, so we really ram them in. Right. And they just pick away all night, and they love them. Look, look, I mean, they can't wait. No, they really do love <laughs> them. And I have to ask, does it not sting their tongue or their lips? Obviously not. I mean, we stick some really big, nasty thistles in here as well, and they seem to love it. Right, how are we doing? Right. More in here still? You want I to really pack it? We're, yeah, we're pretty well getting there, aren't we? Ow, it really does, <laughs> does sting. sting. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a tried and tested thing, is it? You've, you've done this before? Yeah, we do this every evening for them when the nettles are out. Who collects them? Um, is that, is that a, uh, do, do your decision or does... Uh, that, as head of section, straw? that's my decision. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else goes and picks them. And is there one particular that giraffe that, um, that has a real weakness for this stinging nettle basket? Imogen really likes them and the bull as well, Kohiri. Right. He right. He'll, he'll go for them. He, so he'll actually... gonna, are you going to hang You're presumably going to hang it from this? Um, yeah, we hang it up high so it spins around as well, so it's really, really, really awkward for them to get <laughs> You out. don't make it easy for them at all, Absolutely do you? Absolutely not. Look no, at them all, they're all that's... waiting. For it. I mean, and as this kind of swings around and spins as well, it's it's really tough. Well, they're coming in straight away. Excellent. Look at that. There we go. I can't. I really can't believe those noses that look so delicate. Aren't they getting Don't get stung? stung by that? That certainly beats um, an evening cup of tea, doesn't it? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Tea and biscuit before bed. <laughs> Seeing nettles. <laughs> no. Well, sadly, that's all we've got time for on today's programme, so we're going to leave the giraffes happy with their nettles and let you know what's coming up on the next Animal Park. Who's <laughs> A widowed otter is desperate for love, but can they find her a mate? One of the big troubles we've had with her at the moment is she's always out looking to us. She hasn't got a partner to enjoy spending time with. We go back 30 years to hear how the chimps escaped to the mainland. The boat had gone and the chimp had gone. The chimp was <laughs> rowing back across to the mainland and the fellow was stuck on the island. And how will the keepers cope when I break down in the tiger enclosure? Hello, could you just come at the track at the moment, right? OK, thank you. Yeah, we've just got a tiger coming over. That's all coming up in the next...